Shout out to all my non-denominational friends out there. What's up, Independence? How are you today? Thanks for checking into the channel. My name is Matthew, one of the pastors here at Gospel Fellowship PCA. Today, we're going to talk about independent churches and non-denominationalism. And I suppose that you probably think I'm going to smash on you because I'm Presbyterian and you're independent or non-denominational, and I'm going to tell you why you're wrong and I'm right. Well, that's only partially true. I'm going to do that a little bit, <laughs> a little bit later in the video. But the first thing I wanted to do is just totally relate to you, non-denominational friends. I know there's a lot of you out there. A lot of you are part of churches that have no affiliation. Some of you are Baptistic. I'd guess probably the majority of you are Baptistic. In fact, if you're pedo baptistic you're probably part of a Reformed denomination, one of the NAPARC denominations, PCA, OPC, RPCNA, something like that. There's not a lot of independent churches or non-denominational churches that baptize babies. That's kind of an interesting thing to think about because in congregationalism, going back to its earlier roots, for instance, in the Savoy Declaration, or even here in America, churches like the Northampton Church of Jonathan Edwards were pedo baptistic churches, and yet they were independent in terms of their ecclesiology. I could go on a whole video and probably should sometime about Edwards's church, the Northampton church, in its unusual ecclesiastical form. It did have some deacons, but the elders had died out during the days of Solomon Stoddard before Edwards took over the church. At the same time, Solomon Stoddard, Jonathan Edwards's grandfather, was trying to build something like a proto-presbytery in terms of the Hampshire Association. It's a very interesting historical anecdote there. I guess my point is, though, if you're Baptistic, you're probably also independent or non-denominational. Now, sometimes there's a little tricky wicket there. Churches will say they're part of a Baptist association, but they're independent in terms of their ecclesiology, and I'm sure there's some details to be ferreted out there. But, you know, one thing I wanted to do in this video for the sake of my non-denominational friends is just to kind of relate to you for a few minutes here, because even though fundamentally I'm in disagreement with you on this, I definitely understand the non-denominational impulse. One of the reasons I understand the non-denominational impulse is because I too was one time non-denominational. In fact, it was a pretty important time in my life. Reviewing my testimony in 10 seconds, grew up as a Lutheran, baptized, uh, confirmed first communion in the Lutheran church, ELCA, liberal church. And then after I got saved, ironically at a Pentecostal church, I came into non-denominationalism for some time. So most of my high school years and my college years, a good seven, eight years there, were spent in a non-denominational church, which today could roughly be classified as a mega church. The chapel in downtown Akron, the chapel on Fernhill, Fernhill main campus, had thousands of people. And for the most part, during my time there, it was a pretty solid church. I had good pastors, I had good youth pastors, I had good mentors, the church had a very strong expository preaching uh, pattern under the ministry of Newt Larson, who by the way is a, a mensch and a stud and a scholar and a gentleman. Um, he is retired of course, but he was a wonderful pastor, knew the names of thousands of people and he preached through books of the Bible in an expository manner, so I'm always thankful for that. Had some good youth pastors too, uh, Jody Bowser, Kevin Delaney during college, my friend Mike Arnold, lots of wonderful people in the non-denominational world at the chapel there. And part of the reason why I understand the non-denominational impulse is because of this. Looking back after I got saved um, to the Lutheran church, at that time, I began to despise what I saw or thought was an overemphasis on tradition and traditionalism. Um, because even though I learned some wonderful things as a Lutheran, especially the creeds and uh, some basic Trinitarian doctrine, Ten Commandments, Lord's Prayer, Apostles' Creed, etc., and I was always very thankful for that base, and I even began reading through the scriptures while I was a Lutheran. Um, yet after I was saved, I began to look back on the Lutheran church with some kind of disdain. And the reason is because in all of my uprearing as a Lutheran kid, a child for the most part, into my middle school years, I never heard a clarion gospel heralding, <laughs> which is ironic because the Lutherans, of course, under the influence of Martin Luther from the 1500s, had a very strong emphasis on law and gospel, the law, but then the saving gospel. But in recent years, of course, as you probably know, the Lutheran Church, like many, many mainline denominations, began to liberalize and to move away from 
their original confessional beliefs, including a preaching of the gospel, especially the ELCA, the liberal behemoth mainline liberal Lutheran denomination, and instead move into emphases on good deed doing, social justice, and all those kinds of things, which, of course, good deeds are good. That's why they're called good in the scriptures. They are not saving. And so I resented my Lutheran upbringing because they did not preach the gospel to me. In other words, they did not warn me of hell. They did not warn me of judgment. They did not warn me of death and uh, the promise of eternal life in Christ. And when I heard that, there's a very clarion call at this Pentecostal church, which interestingly, I never really went back to. Um, I looked back on my Lutheran church and I thought to myself, what were you doing? Why didn't you preach the gospel to us? Why didn't you herald the good news of John 3.16? You taught me the Ten Commandments. You never taught me John 3.16, that I needed to be born again or born from above John 3, right? And so I looked back on that as so much tradition and traditionalism, and I began to reject the entire idea of denominations as such. And so moving into those high school years at the chapel and my college years at the chapel, especially as I began to study theology at Malone College and got deeper and deeper into the Bible, and I began to come into some reform teachings slowly but surely, um, I looked back again on denominations and I thought, well, this is just so much bunk. I don't understand it. I don't think it's necessary. It seems like a distraction. Um, where are the missionaries? Where are the evangelists? Where is the preaching of the gospel? And so I looked back on the Lutheran megaopolis, as it was, the metropolis of all of the various accoutrements of denominationalism, and I thought it was essentially a distraction from the gospel. And so to all of my non-denominational listeners out there, let me first just relate to you and say, I totally get it. I totally get it. There is a sense of freedom in non-denominationalism that is not present in the denominations. And here's what I mean by that. Um, any church that is not connected to a denomination can pivot on a dime. They can hire, they can fire, they can do this, they can do that, they can go multi-campus, they can send missionaries, they can ordain their own people. It's really, really easy to move through um, your ministry and your mission if you don't have those sort of denominational encumbrances. So, for instance, again, uh, just by way of example, the chapel did not have to deal with anything like the PCA's Book of Church Order, which regulates all of our churches. It tells us what elders are, what deacons are, what teaching elders or pastors do, what is the role of the presbytery, what is the role of the general assembly, what processes should be used when church discipline is necessary. All of that is spelled out for us in our book of church order, but a non-denominational church like the chapel, they only have to create their own bylaws. And so that allows them the, the nimbleness, the agility, the freedom then to pivot and move and advance and regress as they see fit. And to some extent, I see that as an advantage of non-denominationalism. Not only that, but then there's this too. And I think this is probably one of the reasons why a lot of you non-denominationals really rejoice in your non-denominationalism. And that is that you are not encumbered by any of the negative reputation of the denominations. Now here again, I'm going to totally relate to my independent friends here on the other side of the screen because one of the things that really, really stinks, I mean, this is like a dead weight. This is terrible. I hate it when a, a local church, because of the name on the, on the board, the name on the bulletin, the name on the door, suffers the ill reputation of the liberal, secular, progressive drift that, of course, most, if not all, of the mainline denominations have suffered. We're still struggling with this, and we're in the PCA, uh, the Presbyterian Church in America, a very conservative denomination. My friends in the RPCNA still struggle with this, a very conservative reform denomination. We struggle from the ill reputation, the malignant, cancerous reputation of the liberal drift of the mainline Presbyterian Church. In fact, any time you look at Presbyterianism in the news, it's probably because the mainline denomination, the PCUSA, did something really stupid, really secular, really atheistic, and really unbelieving. And because they're the biggest, largest denomination, that ill reputation seeps down like, like, like a cancerous goo 
into the very name Presbyterian itself, so that even the conservative denominations are then tinged by that malignant reputation of the mainline. And the same thing is true with Anglican churches and with Baptistic churches to some extent, though Baptistic churches are more independent, of course, obviously. But nevertheless, there are mainline denominations with the name Baptist, associations, whatever you want to call them. And they do affect the reputation of other churches. The same thing would be true with congregational churches, even though, interestingly, they are congregational in form, something like the United Church of Christ, the UCC, which ostensibly is congregational, and yet it's another one of those liberal, sort of disgusting, malignant, secularist um, movements that, unfortunately, even the word congregational then is tinged by its liberalism. Same thing, too, with Episcopalianism, Anglicanism, I probably already said that, Lutheranism, as already mentioned, and this is one of the problems. And so I totally get it why you want to name your church something that doesn't have one of those words in the title because of all of the baggage, the liberal baggage, the leftism, the unbelief. It's really disgusting. And it's sad, isn't it, that so many churches have to suffer through the misdeeds, the unbelieving, heinous misdeeds of some of the mainline denominations, especially in the 20th century, as they repudiated their own roots they said goodbye to their own histories, they jettisoned their own confessions, and they came into some sort of like amorphous amalgam of basic liberal Christianity. And so again, like non-denoms, I totally get it. You don't want to be set apart or set down or uh, be smirched in your reputation by the drift, the always leftward disgusting drift of liberalism. So I understand that. The other way that I'll relate to you, non-denoms, is in your disdain for the, polit the politics and the machinations within the denomination itself, okay? So somebody's got to be elected clerk, and somebody's going to get the title of bishop, and somebody's going to be the overseer of the conference, or what it is, whatever it is, whatever title, various denominations give different names to those kinds of roles. Those administrative heads of the regional and even national church bodies are just as political as we see in the bipolarity between the Democratic and Republican parties in terms of our federal bipolar two-party denominational or uh, uh, national federal system. Um, those kinds of elections, those kinds of appointments can be just as political. And I totally get it. Like if you don't want to argue about who's going to be the bishop and what power the conference over overseer should have over you or the stated clerk and his or her influence, as the case may be, there's a real sense of freedom in just throwing all of that out and saying, no, I don't want it. We don't have time to do it. And speaking of time, here's one other benefit of the non-denominationals. And you're, you're probably thinking by this point, I want to be non-denominational, right? Well, hold on. I'll swing back the pendulum to the other angle in just a minute. But um, there's, there's, just a real, there's just a real freedom that you have in, in the non-denominational church. And, and what I mean by that is this. You don't have to worry about presbytery meetings. You don't have to worry about presbytery committees. You don't have to worry about presbytery offerings or other things you just focus on the local church and i'll admit that there's something kind of attractive about that there's a part of me that thinks that presbytery meetings take up a lot of time and that presbytery committees take up a lot of lifeblood of sometimes the best and most talented people that the church has and instead of focusing on its own people its own committees its own ministry its own widows its own orphans it instead has to detract a lot of church lifeblood to these other committees, which are sort of removed from the life of the local church. And yes, I'll admit it. Um, sometimes when I go to presbytery meetings, and by the way, teaching elders or pastors are required to go to presbytery meetings, and we're, it's really assumed. I'm not sure if it's technically mandatory, but it's really assumed that every pastor is also going to serve on a presbytery committee. The demand is just implied that you're going to do this. Well, that's time taken away from my wife, my family, my kids, my ministry, my church, my elders, my deacons, my widows. All of that pulls me aside and, and puts me into another gear that is sometimes, yes, it's a distraction and even a hindrance to the thing that, you know, I feel called to do, which is to pastor this particular local church. 
Now, having said all of that, again, you probably think that I'm about to go indie. <laughs> but no, I can't. And the reason is because in my heart, I actually believe that Presbyterianism is fundamentally correct. And here's why I believe that. First, and let me tick off a couple of reasons here. I, I honestly, with all my heart, believe that the Presbyterian system is that system that is given to us in the scriptures for the sake of accountability. And, and let me tick off a couple of reasons here. What happens if a pastor goes rogue? You say, well, that would never happen. I like my pastor. <laughs> cool. Glad you like him. That's great. But throughout the history of the church, we would be absolute fools, wouldn't we, to think that pastors don't go rogue on a regular basis. Matter of fact, they go rogue in a number of ways. And one of the things, I just want to bring this up real quick here. In my book, Worship Tainment, you know, some of you have said that it's just a book about church music. It's definitely not. I have chapters on preaching. I do have a chapter on music. I have a chapter on liturgy. I have a chapter on pastoral leadership. And in my chapter on pastoral leadership, one of the things I talk about is what I call this dark octagon of personality traits, wherein certain people with extreme talents, um, actual talent, also tend to have pride and ambition and competitiveness and other attributes, which unfortunately end up cutting their own ministries out by the knees. I've seen it so many times. Um, if they cannot control themselves because of their pride, they end up doing a lot of great damage to the church. And when they do that, not if, but when, who is going to keep them accountable? Well, a lot of times they've set up the structure in independent churches to the extent that there's nobody that can possibly keep them accountable because that strong leader will simply hire and fire people in accordance with his will and he's going to constantly surround himself with fewer and fewer people to the extent that he himself has something like an autonomous grip on the church. And then it becomes very difficult for the congregation to rear up against that person or to fire that person. And sometimes, yes, firing pastors is absolutely necessary. But in a Presbyterian system of government, you do have a built-in accountability such that because of our church book of order, now you may think that's an encumbrance in some ways, and perhaps it is, yet nevertheless, we have policies and procedures by which a pastor can be held ultimately accountable for his deeds or misdeeds, as the case may be. Okay, so let's just think about a couple of situations in which that has taken place. Number one, um, Mark Dris Driscoll, okay? So in the Mars Hill system, Driscoll's control and leadership over that church was such that it was very difficult for the church to ever hold him into any kind of accountability. Uh, ultimately, of course, he did lose his ministry there, but only to go on and plant another independent church with dubious systems of accountability. Or how about the Steve Lawson case, which recently came up? One of the interesting things, according to at least the protestia.com article, suggests that Steve Lawson was never actually a member of that local church and did not have any kind of real accountability from the elders because he was not one of the elders. As it appears, and I think facts are still kind of emerging here, and it's certainly been very, very murky. It appears that they hired Steve Lawson just to preach to them and kept him removed from the other duties of the biblical office of the elder. Well, listen, that could not ever happen in a Presbyterian system. It is impossible. The Presbyterian system, though sometimes it's a little herky-jerky in its inability to move with nimbleness, at least it has built-in structures that rogue pastors, e either morally or doctrinally, or in terms of their worship, or otherwise, they can and will be held into accountability, okay? Second thing about Presbyterianism, there is help outside of the local church. Now, certain non-denominational or independent churches, they, they do loosely affiliate with other churches that are like-minded. I think that's good. But one of the main problems that I have with independence or non-denominationalism is simply this— are you really saying 
correct me if I'm wrong, are you really saying that there is no other church on the face of God's green earth that you can work together with in a helpful association or presbytery of believers? Are you so independent that there's literally no other? I mean, that's what it means, right? The, the name non-denominational means we do not function in cooperation with any other churches. Could that possibly be the true Christian doctrine? It, it seems to me so strange because when you look at the pages of the New Testament, one of the things that you find is that the churches are constantly working with and for one another. I mean, think about all of the ways that Paul in his letters is greeting, helping, sending, receiving, training, keeping into account all of the various churches. It's really impossible to look at the interconnectedness of the church of Rome and Corinth and Ephesus and Thessalonica and Philippi and other places, Jerusalem, and suppose that these were independent churches that refused to cooperate with one another. It just doesn't work. I mean, look at the end of Romans, for instance. Paul's never even been to Rome, and yet he gives this long list of people to greet there. And all of this is because of the, the living interconnectedness of the early church with one another. And so the real baseline advantage then to a Presbyterian system, and I, I, I do think, and I'm arguing here, that the New Testament church was Presbyterian in government, is that there are churches to help each other. You want to plan a new church? Great. You pull your finances and you, you do things that you could not possibly do as an independent church. There's a rogue teacher who's gone, who's gone um, off the beaten path in terms of his doctrine or his morality. Great. There's other churches to call that person to account. You want to send missionaries to foreign places. Great. We can do that. We can do that together. And so the Presbyterian system ultimately then has way more advantages. Yes, it's slow. Yes, it lurks along like a behemoth at times. But there's an ability to do so many things together that independent or non-denominational churches simply can't do. And as I argued in a previous video a couple of weeks ago, Acts 15, the Jerusalem Council, is the very precedent for not only the Presbytery meeting as such, but really functionally the General Assembly. If you look at Acts chapter 15, you have all of these various representatives, elders and apostles from the various churches coming together to Jerusalem to hold this council in which they weigh out with arguments and biblical rationale a particular theological problem, actually the problem, which is how is a sinner saved, okay? There was, there was a problematic teaching about the necessity of becoming Jewish and circumcised before one could be saved by grace through faith. No, thankfully, there was the General Assembly by which they could come together and they could work on this particular problem. And that is basically the model that we are trying to accomplish in our PCA Book of Church Order, which I happen to have right here in my hand. That's essentially what we're trying to do is to model Acts chapter 15, okay? And then finally, I just wanna say this, um, and this video has gone a little bit longer than I thought, but that's okay. One of the, the main problems, challenges that pastors experience is loneliness. Do you know why? It is that so many pastors have such short-lived tenures in the pulpit. Why are so many pastors only able to carry on for three years or five years or, or seven years, and then they completely grind down? Their gears are bent. Um, the, the, the heart is worn. It's worn out. It's frayed and damaged and tired and weak, and they burn out of ministry. Why does that happen? because of loneliness, because of loneliness. You talk to any pastor, it's probably the loneliest man in the church. You say, how can that be? He's up there in front of all these people. Yeah, I know. And it's a lonely position to be in when you're feeling completely alone and tired, sometimes even ostracized from your own family. Um, so loneliness is a major factor. And, and check this out, Presbyterianism is a built-in structure of deep and abiding relationships. Like at first, who are these guys, right? A bunch of dudes in the meeting. I see them a few quarter times a year, four times a year, five maybe at General Assembly. But writ large and over a long period of time, these are your co-laborers in the ministry. And Presbyterian pastors do very well 
to make deep and lasting relationships with their co-laborers in the Lord. And it's like a built-in system of friends. Uh, these are your colleagues and your allies. Um, the best analogy I can come up with just kind of on the spot would be the old wrestling team, right? From high school or junior high or college if you wrestled. It's an independent sport. You're out there alone and you cannot tag team somebody in on the mat with you. But at the same time, uh, there's a whole bench of brothers and men that are cheering for you, uh, calling out to you, there for you when you lose, as everybody does, and ultimately embracing you in the bond of brotherhood because they go through the very same struggles that you do. Same thing as like the, the, the foxhole brotherhood in the military, I suppose. But Presbyterian pastors have this built-in system of true accountability and friendship that I think that independent and non-denominational people just don't have. So at the end of the day, while I can completely relate to my non-denominational and independent friends, I do think that Presbyterianism is the best system of all. Well, thank you so much for checking into this long video. Hey, by the way, listen, I don't ask for you to support me on Patreon. I don't ask for people to like and subscribe. I don't do a lot of that nonsense. But if you want to support what I do here on this channel, I would love it if you would think about purchasing Worshiptainment, the Modern Church's Golden Calf. If you've already read it, maybe get one for your brothers or your elders or your pastors or uh, something like that. Uh, I would really appreciate that. That does help me out. And uh, other than that, I don't ask for a lot from you, support from you. I don't even do the like and subscribe thing because I, I know you'll watch if, if you like my content. All right. Thanks for checking in. I do love you lots and I'll talk to you later.